A very warm welcome to another opportunity to talk growth, to talk Africa first. I'm Felicity Ezewike, your host on One Slot. So today we're taking on agriculture. The sector is critical to the African economy. It accounts for 23% of the GDP and 49% of employment. The continent's population is projected to more than double by 2050. One in every four person on planet Earth in that year will be in sub-Saharan Africa. This means that the continent's output must thrive and meet the demands of its growing population. How can Africa maximize agricultural productivity to ensure food security and economic growth? How can we improve the region's export potential? How can we utilize the African continental free trade area and the increasing modernization of agricultural processes to enhance significant growth opportunities across the entire agricultural ecosystem? In summary, what is the next frontier for the sector? Dr. Tony Bello is our guest for this conversation. He is a highly acclaimed food scientist and entrepreneur with over 30 years of professional and business experience with United States Fortune 500 companies, United Nations Development Program, UNDP, and the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development in Nigeria. Dr. Bello has consulted for leading food companies in the United States, China, Taiwan, Trinidad and Tobago, Bosnia, Kosovo, Mexico and Netherlands, just to name a few. Let's just say he is very vast in the business of agriculture in Africa and beyond. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the program, Dr. Bello. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Felicity. My pleasure. You've been in the sector for a very long time, over three decades to be precise. So I would want to ask you, if you were to sum the agricultural sector's growth in the over three decades you've been in the field, how would you describe it? Negative growth. In the Nigerian context, in the sub-Sahara Africa context, and in the African context. However, a very positive growth in the developed world by the leverage of science and technologies. And this is what, what we are doing to be sure that Africa can never be left behind. Let us work together uh, to bring the best practices, the best expertise to bear in Africa's agricultural sector. And most importantly, in the food and beverage industries. And uh, so I am very uh, happy to be with you this morning to talk, or afternoon, uh, to talk Africa and how we can together, the media, uh, the smallholder farmers, the government entities, the development partners and entrepreneurs, how we can work together uh, to be sure that we're able to feed our people. I, I frankly wasn't expecting you to say that the, the, the growth wasn't um, a lot because, I mean, from an outside position, it looks like a lot is happening in the African continent when it comes to agriculture. But you seem to have a different opinion. You don't believe that the sector is growing as it should. Why is that? Uh, you know, uh, everything is kind of relative. And so when you talk three decades of experience, uh, when I left Nigeria in 1977, we were exporting cocoa, peanuts, uh, sesame, cotton, and name it. Those were the glorious years of Nigeria. And fast forward that to 2012, uh, under the Akiwumi Additional, uh, as head of the Ministry of Agriculture, we started to talk about agriculture as a business. The lag time is a negative. And we thank God that after that era, we all in Nigeria started to see agriculture as a business. So that is the forward move. But overall, you're talking 30 years. So the baseline, should, we should have been much further off from where we are than agriculture is a business as of 2012. 
the future is not so much of the tools that we have in our toolbox to make agriculture become uh, the, the, to contribute more to the GDP, but shifting from the agricultural base to manufacturing. And we are way, way behind in food processing and consumer packaged goods. We are still importing Africa, most of Africa. We are importing what we would call industrial food ingredients. We have mastered ourselves in primary agriculture. Uh, at this stage of our development, at this stage of Nigeria's independence, we should be talking about exporting consumer packaged goods that is produced from African staples, not how to export Gary. Uh, let's talk about how to export sackable cassava snacks uh, to the West. Let's talk about how we meet the global demand for gluten-free and grain-free consumer packaged foods. That's right. where we ought to be. Uh, Dr. Bello, I, I, I think we, we need to uh, clarify if your reference is for Africa-wide or Nigeria, because uh, the conversation is trying to look at growth across board in Africa when you're talking about agriculture. So are you, is your position a, a general for Africa or you're specific to Nigeria? Uh, it's general for Africa, so it's really the baseline. Um, in 2015, 2016, uh, under the leadership of um, the African Development Bank president, they came up for Africa-wide um, five initiatives, one of which was to feed Africa. So let's start from that baseline. Since 2016, we have grown geometrically. But if we go back 30 years of my practice in the industry, uh, we have not done as well. Now that we have a very established leadership and there is clarity on what needs to be done to feed Africa, I think our trajectory is looking much better than it was uh, just 10 years ago. So I'm going to take from what you've said that um, you, you subscribe to the school of thoughts that believes that Africa has, still has a huge amount of untapped um, uh, potential when it comes to um, agriculture. Am I correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what, so what are the areas of these um, uh, development that you think... Um, we are yet to explore. What are these potentials that we don't seem to be tapping into yet? We'll, we'll come to your reference on the use of tech by other uh, countries, um, other continents rather uh, than Africa. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the potential is visionary leadership uh, to start off with and let us together build on the African Development Bank's initiative to feed Africa, to industrialize Africa, to integrate Africa, and to create wealth and improve livelihoods uh, for Africans. Under that platform, with the African Union, with the AFTC, uh, uh, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, we can take our rightful position as leaders in agricultural production by leveraging the 60% of the global arable land that is available to not just feed Africa, but to feed the world. And I think that is where we are bullish and this is where we are heading. And uh, it's a great time for this generation the younger generation to really, really uh, get into the food and beverage industry and get into entrepreneurship opportunities in the agribusiness field. But we have to accelerate. The, the rate of growth has been too slow. Okay, we'll see what we can, uh, the areas we can cover in the course of this conversation. We still have uh, some time. 
Uh, but I'd like you to talk about, from your experience, the years that you've been in the field, how would you say Africans and their leaders should be looking at the Af um, agricultural sector? You've talked about areas we should uh, be interested in. You've talked about growing uh, the leadership, the industrial, the um, integrating well. But Africa has so much other areas. How can we begin? What should we be looking at, basically? How should we be looking at um, agriculture in Africa? Very well. Um, very simple things. Uh, one is mindset. Uh, how do we change the mindset of our people to really understand that agriculture and food, and, and li I like to distinguish between agriculture and food, that the security of Africa will be driven by our ability to produce what we eat in Africa. So the mindset is number one on that priority list. Let us understand the market-driven nature of agriculture globally. While we glorify our farmers, our smallholder farmers, who are mostly subsistence farmers, there is a need to begin to change the mindset of our farmers, both the young, the middle age, and the old, to look at market-driven opportunities beyond family sustenance. While we are at that, after the market, we look at institutional financing. Access to financing is a major, major area of focus for African leaders. And I think we're beginning to do that in one way or the other. The human capital development is critical. When we are talking the food and beverage industry in the United States, just as an example, it is led by the private sector. It is a market-driven economy. It is about technology. It is about innovation. It is about creativity and looking for the best minds in the world. And in my experience in the United States, the US food and beverage industry are open and they have trained and equipped a number of people, at least in the diaspora, uh, many colleagues of African origin, whom we can begin to tap into their experience, into their expertise, who understand practical agriculture, practical food processing, practical manufacturing of consumer packaged goods so that the market can truly drive the okay. agricultural transformation in Africa. You know, I, I don't have space to even write again in my paper because you've said so much. You've talked about uh, mindset change uh, that I'm going to sum as um, education. You've talked about investment, market-driven nature of agriculture, and of course that it should be driven uh, by the private sector. Uh, so if we're talking about the business of agriculture, the, the terminology that I, I think we tend to use is um, agribusiness. So when we talk about um, agribusiness, uh, some people talk about, look at it as the next frontier. Explain to us that might not really understand when you're talking about the next frontier. When we talk about agribusiness and next frontier, what do we mean? What's the connection here? Very well. Thank you. Um, let us for a moment think about the United States and think about companies such as ADM, Akin Daniels Midland Company. Think about Cagill. Think about ConAgra. Think about Gray Millers and a number 
of the leading agribusiness companies in the United States. Think about the mechanization and those leading in that field. It comes from first thinking about the soil, which is the platform for food production. It comes about soil health and preparing the ground for production. Then we look at the agricultural inputs that helps us to increase yield and the economies of scale. And we look at the production practices itself, the mechanization, the uh, timeliness of producing the food, of putting fertilizer and pesticides uh, to be sure that we maximize yield and do not lose our food product to insects, pests, and diseases. We think about preservation techniques to be sure that we preserve the primary produce sufficiently that we do not have mold and fungi growth. So all the things about food quality and safety comes into play. We think about the storage mechanisms, we think about the logistics, then we think market. This, okay. in a nutshell, is what the next frontier in terms of agribusiness is for Africa. And that's what we mean by the agribusiness sector is a place to be. But while we are at that, let us not stop there. And this is my key message. That if we stop there, we would be missing the boat. The next phase of that is what we refer to as the food and beverage industry. The agribusiness sector feed the food and beverage industries. So what is that? Once you have the primary produce, the second major economic opportunity, market opportunity, is what we call industrial food ingredients. Industrial food ingredients are the things we put together, for example, wheat flour, for example, corn flour, corn starch, cassava starch, fruits and vegetables that are turned into concentrates. These are raw materials for food processing and for the manufacturing of consumer ready to eat packaged food products. While we are looking at the business, let us be sure as leaders in the field to integrate agribusiness business with the industrial food ingredients and the consumer packaged food. That is where the economies of scale, job creation opportunities, wealth creation opportunities, that is where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. Uh, and let us not separate the agribusiness sector from the food and beverage industry. We you, must integrate. You, you did say at the beginning of this conversation that it's all uh, interconnected. And uh, you've just, uh, I mean, the areas that you've brought out now, I don't know if we can finish in the time that we have, but we need to go on a break, a very short one. When the cameras come back on us, Dr. Bello will be expanding the conversation on the next frontier. He's already started, so don't go away. Stay with us. I'm very glad you're still with us because this conversation is truly intriguing. I still have Dr. Bello and we're talking agriculture in Africa, the next frontier. Um, Dr. Bello, before we went on that break, you, I mean, you've shed a lot already. So I'm going to try and go back to the things that you said. And one of them is investment. You said we need to invest um, financing, basically. 
Um, and you also said at the beginning of the conversation that Africa is not growing at a pace that it should when it comes to uh, the agricultural sector. So I want to ask, what is the current nature of investment in agriculture today? And what should be the ideal if we are to move to the next level? Uh, very well. Uh, glad to be back and, and thank you, uh, Felicity. It's an interesting uh, uh, conversation we are having here. Uh, very, very exciting. Um, in, in terms of investment, um, the trajectory is that the Africa agribusiness investment opportunity stands at over $1 trillion. That is the opportunity, the market opportunity that we are seeing. Um, the data comes from very reputable uh, consulting management companies uh, in the likes of uh, PwC, Monitor, Deloitte, and, and others. Um, why that market is huge, as we indicated, uh, there's a level of leadership collaboration and partnerships that will be required to unlock this potential. So let us take uh, some key examples. Um, integration of production, agricultural production with food processing with consumer packaged goods manufacturing would take a collaborative and strategic partnership effort. We must have the kind of trust capital that is required for collaboration and working together as true partners. Let us look at the case of Nigeria. In 2013, 2014 timeframe, again, under the leadership of Dr. Akiwumi Adeshina as Minister of Agriculture, we had a number of big time companies making investment commitments with Nigeria under the G7 framework for food security and nutrition, we were able to garner private sector investment commitments of 5.6 billion US dollars. Some of the results we see in the Nigerian example today is out of those investment commitments that were made by I think it was 30 to 35 uh, high profile investors. Within that framework, there were several partnerships that were uh, created to ensure that there was enough raw materials, there was enough food processing capacity for industrial ingredients and enough vision looking forward in terms of the use of the industrial ingredients in consumer packaged foods. So who were some of the top companies? In the case of Nigeria at the time, we had Cargill as a major investor coming in for cassava uh, processing. Uh, I don't remember all of, all of the other details, but just using that as an example, we had investment commitment of 5.6 billion US dollars. That is the kind of leadership that will be required, and we have seen some results. Uh, the improvements in the food and agriculture sector in Nigeria we see today uh, could be linked and directly correlated with those investment commitments. Uh, those that are agribusinesses that are doing very well, I recall uh, working with most of the CEOs and chairmen of those organizations at the time 
Okay, let, let, let me let me let me interject for clarity because I'm trying to um, I'm I'm always trying to come from a position of somebody who is trying to understand what's going on in the agricultural sector. That I, like I don't have you know any pre knowledge of this thing, so I'm going to ask that you clarify. Um, uh, my question is on the nature of investment, the kind of investment that we should be looking at, because there are concerns that you know uh, some investment make us. Um, subservient, make us um, reliant on other countries that have grown. So I wanted to ask the, that you, you've explained the kind of um, investment that will bring result. But the, the, what kind of investment do we currently have and what should be the ideal kind of investment if we are to move to the next frontier without being um, indebted to other countries or uh, businesses, so to speak? Excellent. Thanks for the clarity on that. So within the investment opportunities I spoke about, we, again, let me use for, for a moment uh, the data that was acquired in working with Monitor Deloitte in Nigeria. Um, what were the key constraints to agribusiness investors in Nigeria? Number one, 56% of 75 agribusinesses that were interviewed, 56% said infrastructure was a major challenge, i.e. power, water, roads, energy. Financing stood at parity, 56%. The next at 52% was security of supplies of raw material. After that was human capital development. And to run up the top five of 10 was inconsistencies of policy, policy or what they refer to as policy somersault. These were five major constraints facing other businesses. 75 of them in Nigeria at the time. We went on to look at 16 priority investors. What will it take to unlock your own particular potential? The number one issue for them was policy inconsistencies, which means government had a major role to play. Second for them was access to financing. Again, the government, the development uh, financial institutions had a role to play. Supply security was the third for 16 priority ag agribusinesses. The investment commitment was about 1.5 billion USD in the case of Nigeria. And I think we can extrapolate and take this, the same data to Gambia, to Tanzania, to all of Africa. So what do we need to do as a continent from an investment point of view is investing in infrastructure development to drive market competitiveness by Africans, for Africans, Again, looking for technocrats who are not corrupt, who are not looking for how to enrich themselves, but are after the general good of our people, the Africans. Okay. Access to financing in a collaborative manner and everything we are currently doing to leverage the 60% of arable land that is available oh, in Africa okay. for productive agriculture at scale. All right. Um, let, let me... Last but not the least, the human capital. Yeah, Bring I think you, 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 you're actually policies, human capital, security, finance, and uh, infrastructure. Uh, these are some key areas. And in the course of my preparing for, I also saw that that was um, um, among the issues that needed to be talked about. But I want to go back to something you said earlier. And that's the market-driven nature of agriculture. If we're to leverage that, uh, could you explain a little? Excellent. So let's uh, take 
today's current situation in the world. Russia invasion of Ukraine has created a huge opportunity for Africa and African countries to participate in the supply of raw materials to global food manufacturers, consumer packaged good uh, manufacturers. How is that? 30% of wheat that is consumed globally comes out of Russia and Ukraine. Africa has a wheat program, I uh, don't recall the details, but again, under the African Development Bank platform. How do we take that to scale today to be sure that we participate in the market that is driven by the disruptions of the crisis, humanitarian, military, and food crisis that the Russia invasion is bringing to the world. That's a right now kind of opportunity. Second, what do we produce the most of in Africa? I would beg to say cassava is one of them that is underutilized. How do we bring in food science and technology innovations to leverage what we produce, at least in the sub-Saharan African regions, and even in Tanzania, in, in Kenya, in Uganda, in Gambia, and others? How do we get transformation from high quality cassava flour today to make crackers to make pizza crust that is in high demand in the global market. So science, research, and development innovation becomes a big opportunity. How do we make sure that we have implementing implementation partners who knows what they are doing and not rely on equipment manufacturers when we put our investment dollars down? These are the questions we should be asking so we can participate in the global market opportunities right. that is created by current crisis and that could be driven through research and development innovation. Uh, not to be a heel, but I, I need to ask, there are concerns. You, you said yourself that we, we still have some ways to go when it comes to agriculture uh, in Africa. Uh, there are those who say we should be focusing on intra-African trade for now, other than looking at exporting. But on the flip side, uh, one would say that if we are to make income, exports should be on top of the rack. So how do we, how do you, how do you explain uh, this kind of scenario? Very well, thank you. Uh, I love this. I, I, I think I am uh, at the risk of, of pretending to, to be uh, um, an African Development Bank staff, but I'm sorry <laughs> to say they have given us the roadmap. And so let me, with all sense of humility, submit to the pillars of growth that they have spelled out for us. That is number one, integration. And the African, uh, African um, uh, free trade uh, uh, area is all about integration of Africa. We cannot give away what we do not have. So for us, first, is to create surpluses. That is where the African continental free trade uh, area and agreement, where it, the opportunity is there. First, let us feed ourselves. But while we are feeding ourselves, let us have the milestones of creating surpluses. Because that's where the globe, the world market is. When we are able to feed ourselves and we create those surpluses, 
then we can export value added products. So it is the integration of visionary leadership that is required. How do we convert our waste to wealth? So we do not necessarily have to take another 10 years to do this with a focused visionary leadership within a two, three year time frame. Let us create surpluses with commodities where we have comparative and competitive advantage. If we can demonstrate that proof of principle to the world, investments will come into Africa, the human capital will come in, good governance will come in, everything good will come in because we're able to feed ourselves, we're able to secure our, uh, our boundaries, and we are able to be part of the global market, you, participating you, 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 with higher value food products. Uh, all right, I, I want you to speak on the uh, free trade agreement. You, you mentioned it just now. What, what, how are we using it in the agricultural sector to grow it, basically? Are we really exploring the benefits of the um, AFC? Uh, um, AFCFTA, I always have a problem with getting the African Free Trade Agreement. Um, how are we exploring it to grow the agricultural sector? Um, I, I wish uh, I could say I have um, something of substance to say about that. I'm afraid I am not. Why? For all the things I said before, we are struggling with uh, lack of productivity in the agricultural sector. So for individual country concerns right now, it is hard to feed their own people. That is number one. Out of our surpluses, at least from a food and agribusiness point of view, out of our surpluses, we would be looking for the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreements and how to implement. The good news is that there is an agreement. Agreement is critical. And now we define the roles from an in-country point of view. And I know that many African countries have staffed uh, ministries, departments, and agencies of government, but let them bring in the private sector so that we can drive the investments. So I think the jury is still out. I am not sure if we can really say we are leveraging opportunities right now. Uh, nevertheless, it is enhancing the ease of doing business between neighboring countries. And we can think of uh, ECOWAS region, uh, that movement of goods between Nigeria, uh, Ghana, and the neighboring countries is much more improved. Um, uh, the Republic of Benin is much more improved. Uh, you look at the, the East African bloc, uh, things are improving. So uh, there's a reduction, an apparent reduction in the cost of doing business. And that is a, a good, quick win to have under our belt. All right. Uh, I think this conversation is quite broad, but we're trying to see what we can do. We'll go on another break now. Um, when we come back, the conversation continues and we'll be looking at the future of agriculture, the use of tech. He did mention the small time farmers, their role. Are they still relevant? Of course, we're also going to try and explore the role of policymakers and governments. We'll be right back. One slot still here with Dr. Tony Bello. Uh, before we went on that break, we were talking about the, you know, some of the things that we need to explore if we really need to. I mean, that's basically what we've been talking about, the next frontier for agriculture. 
I want us to go back to something you also said earlier in the, your opening remarks. You talked about Africa not actually leveraging technology as we should, you know, when it comes to improvement in agriculture. I want to ask why this is so. Why aren't we exploring um, technology enough to grow um, agriculture in this part of the world? And what needs to give? <clears throat> if we really want to join the rest of the world when it comes to the advancement in the use of technology um, in agriculture? Anyway, I, I think traditionally, um, subsistence farming mindset has dominated the African agricultural uh, uh, production uh, ecosystem. And therefore, there is somewhat of a high level of illiteracy uh, that we have seen over the years. The good news today is that the youth are getting involved and we are seeing significant growth in the use of technology platforms in creating smallholder family communities across every country that I have been personally involved with in Africa. We are seeing mechanization coming alive. I recall the African uh, Development Bank uh, Investment Forum of 2019, meeting a young man, I believe his company was Halo Tractor. Uh, and as a youth, as an entrepreneur, uh, I believe a Halo Tractor and many others uh, are really, really bringing significant improvements in the mechanization area. Um, even in my home state, uh, Edo State, I know I have worked with uh, the Edo State government uh, as well as a service provider in Edo State supported by the government in terms of tractorization and mechanization. Um, we have cultivated a little over 1,500 hectares of cassava farm and the technology platform has been deployed to get the kind of results that we are seeing over there. Uh, in the interest of time, I, I, well, I just noticed we're almost uh, far gone. I, I need you to speak quickly on the, the role of small-scale farmers. You, you, you did say, yeah, what will, will they still have a role if we continue to commercialize and, you know, industrialize and use all the tech that is available? Will they still be relevant in the scheme of things? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, our company, we, we, over the last two years, we worked uh, very collaboratively with uh, a US-based uh, company uh, with USAID and another partner in the US. Our commitment to that project uh, was tw over 12,000 smallholder farmers to cultivate cassava to meet our industrial needs. What is changing is the ability of the private sector to lease land or acquire contiguous land. And the government is providing input financing for those smallholder farmers. So we are seeing win-win situations where smallholder farmer cooperatives are brought in into commercial production. And I would give kudos again to uh, Nigeria in this case, uh, where the Agriculture for Food and Just Plan have a validated database of over 10, I believe 1.5 million farmers as of when I work with them very closely. But database of smallholder farmers are becoming uh, another market opportunity and uh, yes, they have a major role to play. And as we bring in the youth into agricultural production and they have the ready market, 
uh, the sky is the limit for the African countries uh, to create that surplus uh, that I talked about yeah. earlier. Yeah, you, you, you've been talking about the place of leadership um, in the course of this conversation. You've happed a lot on it. I, I want to um, take it from this angle. There is an agenda, uh, 2063, I believe, um, to get uh, governments in Africa to give at least 10% of their national budget to the agricultural sector. Um, to what level do you think that there, there's going to be compliance? Are we going to meet that agenda? And what would be your expectation, uh, the kind of things that you want the government, the leadership to be doing and putting in place if we are to go forward? Very well, thank you. Um, it is called the uh, uh, Malibu or Maputo Declaration, um, the 10 percent contributions of government. Um, why that is good from a development lens? Why that is good, the question would be, how do we catalyze that 10% investment by government through private sector investments. That is the key to success. And what we are finding out is most of the multilateral development and donor institutions are shifting from uh, making investments to governments and shifting to public-private sector partnership platforms. So if Tanzanian government chooses to give 10% in compliance with uh, the Malibu Declaration, let it be tied to the private sector investments. Okay. Let us catalyze that by a ratio of one to 10, and whatever that may be, and enable the private sector to lead the implementation. Uh, it's a high time that we stop writing white papers. It's a high time we engage businesses, entrepreneurs to come in and help us create food surpluses so that Africa can participate in the global food economy. I guess it's a good place to leave it for today. Thank you very much, Dr. Tony Bello, for your time and the insights you've provided in this conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Felicity. My pleasure. From all that's been discussed today, here's my two cents. I believe, like our guest and many others, that the African agricultural sector will witness a more exponential growth over the next decade. But this can only be guaranteed if the sector diversify, and guest said that as well, enough, and continues to invest in the areas that have been identified to inhibit growth, particularly finance and infrastructure. Diversification of produce as well, and investing in farmer education is also of importance. I'm confident we will feed ourselves well and the rest of the world, just a matter of time. That's where we wrap things up for today. Thank you very much for joining us. We're back again next time for more conversation. Bye for now.